recently completed a study which we've called the doggy bag study, which is the short term for the determination of gluten grams ingested and excreted by adults eating gluten-free study. But the other reason why it's called the doggy bag study is because essentially what we did is we took advantage of the fact that you can use gluten as a marker of gluten ingestion because you can measure gluten in food and then gluten peptides are not digested. They come out intact in stools. So you can measure them in poop but some of them are absorbed, so you can actually measure them in P2. And so for this study, we had patients collect not only their food, but also their stool and their urine, and we looked for gluten in that. We realized that, you know, in restaurants, a doggy bag is really the leftovers you take. And that is what we had thought about because looking at food that people with CFD are actually eating and not just picking products off the shelf that haven't been processed hadn't really been done before. So that was what we were thinking about with doggy bags. But because so many people have urban dogs and they're always chasing them with their doggy bags, it actually fits in with the stool too. Mm -hmm. So it all in all is a good acronym. So we have in Canada a group of patients with celiac disease who we've been following and they're having follow-up biopsies. And so what we did is we asked these uh, study participants before they had their follow-up biopsy if they could collect samples of their food, stool, and urine for 10 days. And then they collected these samples and sent them, brought them back to us. And with our collaborators in Spain, we looked to see if they had any of these gluten peptides in them. And the idea of the study was to really get an idea of how much gluten is in a gluten-free diet. We encouraged people in the study to eat their regular diet. We encouraged them to eat out at restaurants, but they weren't necessarily wanting to give us their restaurant food. And we also um, encouraged people to try different things. And so definitely most people ate out at a restaurant at least once and many people ate something that maybe they got from a farmer's market that they were told was gluten-free, but they really wanted to know, and so that's why they decided to eat it during the study. For the subjects doing this study, uh, definitely it was challenging sometimes, but I'm always amazed by how well our study participants are able to problem solve. And usually I try and give them somewhat minimalistic instructions because they fill in the blanks much better than I ever could. And so definitely we had people who were doing the study who were traveling or visiting or vacationing who managed to collect samples for almost every day, which is pretty phenomenal. We provided supplies to collect them and uh, containers to put them in. The participants didn't seem to have a problem with bringing us their stool and their urine. Uh, there weren't that many people who thought that was a problem. I think partly because they were curious to know, because really we don't know whether people are getting gluten because this is the first time we've had the tool to check. And so there's been a lot of interest in the study just because it's novel information. We also, we studied adults who generally tend to be a little bit more compliant. Definitely we're doing a study now at Children's where we're trying to recruit teenage girls and they have very little interest in collecting stool for us. So we are finding gluten, which was not unexpected. and. There's lots of reasons for that, but the headlines are that we found out of 18 patients that 12 of them had a detectable gluten exposure over that 10-day period in a sample. So some people had multiple samples that were positive, but 12 people had at least one food sample, stool sample, or urine sample that was positive for gluten. We don't really have good techniques to say, okay, we found this much gluten in your urine and work back to say that's how much you ate. But because we had food and we had weighed the food, we knew how much, and we'd ask people to give us about a quarter of their food, we could sort of work back how much gluten they got. And so we worked back both in milligrams and in parts per million. And what we found was that of the positive, stools, of positive food samples, about half of them were under 20 parts per million which is an important point because although they had gluten in them, they would still be considered gluten-free. And I think this is one of the things that the study really makes us think about that we don't necessarily think about as deeply is that gluten-free doesn't mean no gluten. And most people do well on a gluten-free diet and they're probably getting gluten. And so we don't really know, is there a safe threshold and does everybody need the same degree of caution regarding gluten? And so I think that's some of the things, now that we have these tools, we're gonna to start to get more information and answer these questions. Mm -hmm. So we asked people not only to collect their food, but to complete a diary. And one of the questions in the diary, we asked them every day, do you think that you had a reaction to gluten or symptoms of gluten ingestion today? And can you tell us which foods you think had gluten in them? And most of the times that we found gluten, people did not suspect that they had had gluten. 
I think this is really a preliminary study and this is really one of the first studies of its kind and it's hard to do and it's especially hard to do because we really don't have funding to do large studies in patients with celiac disease which has been one of the barriers to doing this study. Um, and so it's hard to really say from this study even though we have data looking at mucosal recovery and how that correlates with gluten exposure, it's hard to really make any generalizations because we only had 18 people. Because these people all had a follow-up biopsy, we looked at whether there was a relationship between gluten exposure and biopsy findings, and we did not find one. So I think the conclusion we can draw is that people who are trying to follow a gluten-free diet are getting gluten, and this may or may not be within the 20 part per million threshold. The 20 part per million threshold isn't something that was scientifically developed, it really is a historical landmark that was based on how well the limit of detection was for gluten at the time the standard was set. And so it's not necessarily that if you have 20 parts per million in everything you eat, that that's going to be a problem. The other way of looking at it is that if you eat a small thing that has 100 parts per million, that might actually be less gluten than a big thing that has 20 parts per million. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to think about the dose of gluten and not just the parts per million because that really is only meaningful information if you know how much you ate. I think an important finding from the study is that people don't necessarily suspect that they're getting gluten. And we've always known that there's a certain proportion of people who are asymptomatic at diagnosis. And there's probably people who get gluten on a gluten-free diet who are asymptomatic. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're symptomatic every time, which is part of the reason why we really don't know the extent to which people are getting exposed to gluten. I think that because we had people who were in a study who knew we were monitoring them and it was only a 10-day period, what we don't know is are there some people who are actually able to avoid gluten all the time? Or if you watched everybody long enough, would you find that there are some people who never got gluten mm -hmm. or everybody got it?